get started unless there's like a whole line outside. Yeah, I told him not to come in. Oh, yeah. Not to come in? Hey guys, welcome, hey. welcome. All right, well, so this is the Image Comics, your favorite books. Here we have a list of superstar creators who are about to help, you know, just pump the hell out of their, their current titles or titles that are very shortly coming in about two weeks. Uh, I'm Sam Stone. I'm, the, uh, I'm a columnist for Image Plus out in comic book stores at the last Wednesday of every month. I also am the uh, co-host co and producer of the Geek Out uh, show on, on iTunes and, and Google Play. But let me go ahead and just go down the line and introduce all the uh, panelists we have. First up at his Baltimore Comic Con debut, we have Andrew McClain. He is the creator of the writer of the artist. Is that Red Light Saber? Okay, it's Red Light Saber, so he said. But yeah, so <laughs> Andrew McClain is the creator of Headlocker, which is all satisfies all your Viking needs as Norgal, the titular uh, Viking warrior, goes through all sorts of fantasy worlds and lops heads. Andrew, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Next up, you may have read her Wonder Woman, you may have read her Grim Fairy Tales. She's also got a, her creator-owned debut through Image Rose in the middle of its first story arc. The, uh, the first volume is collected this November 8th. Uh, it follows the story of one young woman who finds her inner strength in this world of swords and sorcery. Meredith Finch. That's my elevator pitch from now on. <laughs> Good thing we got that on video. But the uh, next up, he's written Swamp Thing, Superman. Is there anybody that Charles Soule hasn't written? The answer to that question is Power Pack. He's never actually written Power Pack. Never written Power Pack. Yeah, that's you, true. You haven't written? No, I have not written okay, cool. Power Pack. You're correct. Um, you can catch his Image Comics debut with Curse Words. The first volume has already been collected out. Volume one out in comic book stores that he does with Ryan Brown. They're in the middle of their second story arc, Explosion Town, which, as you can you know surmise by the title, is like Speed, but with magic. <laughs> Next up, you kind of have a two for one. You've got Mickey Ryan, you've got Justin Jordan. They're here to talk about their upcoming comic book series, Family Trade. So if you wanted a clandestine steampunk tale in an alternate world with a, in a floating city, well, they got just the book for you. Out everywhere on October 11th, also the same day that the uh, complete Luther Strode collection comes out. It's almost as good as planned. And you can also catch uh, Justin Jordan's work with Spread, which is coming to a close shortly this year as well. All right. So, real quick, if you guys, I guess, I hope I didn't elevator steal your elevator pitch then. If you guys want to give a quick kind of summation about why your Image Comic series is the these readers' favorite new book. Oh my god. <laughs> um, you got this. Uh, why is it your favorite new book? Because um, it's uh, the only book that absolutely promises to have decapitation in every issue. <laughs> Because I've named myself in a corner, and if I don't deliver, I'm fucked. So, <laughs> no, ser in all seriousness, it's uh, it's like kind of like classic fantasy, tongue in cheek. Uh, so it's loaded with violence, um, but fantasy, uh, without being a parody fantasy, is just like super ridiculous. So I can't help but sneak in uh, some some uh, levity here and there. So if you like violence and swords and uh, bulging muscles and blood, then it, it, it is your favorite series. Um, I'm going to say it's your favorite series because I have an amazing art team. Uh, Iguara and Shona Friel are the, the artist and colorist on the book, and I feel like the two of them have just elevated each other to create um, what I think is a masterpiece on every page. It just um, the artwork is stunning, the world that they've created is so vivid and alive, and I feel like now, as a writer, it's just my job to be true to what they're putting on the page. Uh, it's a story about a young girl, like Sam Stead, said, Sam Stead, oh my gosh, what am I saying? <laughs> Sam said, and um, it's uh, a, a land of fantasy, much like yours, but maybe not headlopping and dark violence, because um, we are dealing with a young woman and uh, her coming of age story as she tries to protect her land and um, defeat the evil Queen Drusilla. 
That's a fantastic name choice. Thank you. I was thinking evil stepsister. <laughs> Uh, this question is tough for me because I'm not a big fan of hyperbole, uh, especially when talking about my own work. Um, but I will say that Curse Words is by far the best comic that has ever existed. <laughs> ever. Uh, it, imagine, if you can, New York City. Right? You have it in your head to New York City, Central Park in particular. One day, it's just a normal day in New York, a wizard shows up. His name is Wizard. He's a wizard. Wizard. He looks a little bit like Andrew with the beard, except he has sure. like sweet sunglasses on. And he can grow hair. Yes, and he can grow hair. Um, and he, uh, he also has a talking koala sidekick named Margaret. And he tells everybody, hey man, everything's different now because I can do some magic and I will do some if you want me to. It's great. Everything's good. Everybody's really excited. Problem is that he is in reality a total dick. A total bad dude. And uh, the world sort of embraces him because they think wizards are neat and it's neat to have one around. Uh, but he has a terrible nefarious plan and uh, things kind of go to hell pretty quickly. And that, that's curse words. Uh, the, the elevator pitch for it is Lord of the Rings meets Breaking Bad, but very, very funny. Uh, and most of that is because it's drawn by Ryan Brown, who is the, the funniest picture maker in the business, I think. Um, he's able to do visual comedy in a way that like, I wish I could show you pictures from it right now, I can't. So just imagine that too. Imagine a really funny picture and that's kind of like what Ryan Brown does. Um, but there's still a lot of drama in it. It's like, it's, it's a book that has a lot of, there's a lot of darkness hiding right under the surface of curse words, but it's, it's got this sort of sheen of comedy and beautiful colors and, and like vibrant talking animals in it, so you don't realize how dark it is until you stop and think about it a little bit. And then you're like, whoa, that was really, that was super, super grim. But that's kind of what makes it good. Um, I love it. Uh, we, we drove around in the van for most of the summer, uh, promoting it all over the country, and that was super fun. You guys don't want all that effort to go to waste, so please check it out if you have. Oh, it's my turn. Uh, we have talking cats. You know, That's good. Yeah. Um, Sold. I have, I have cats in mind too. So, but, do you, but is it your cats? No. In yours? I'm totally born a wavelength. Like that. I feel, I feel like, that sounds right. Actually, my cat's name is Drusilla Troutman, the traveling cat. So it's true. We were. Um, so it takes place in a like weird little steampunk island that's man-made, and they have this kind of weird magic that's almost like alchemy, but not quite, and only works there, so you can pick up stuff in this like weird little island of commerce uh, and bring it other places and it doesn't work. And uh, the main character is this badass chick named Jessa, whose entire family is assassins. And uh, as like the youngest member, she's just coming into her own, and she's not doing that great of a job. Yeah, yeah Jessa, Jessa is very enthusiastic and she's just not real experienced yet, so she keeps getting herself into and out of trouble. Um, it's got amazing full watercolor art by Morgan Beam, which uh, much like Charles would like to have images show you, I really would have liked to have had some. So, you know, you can see kind of the silhouette thing that we've got going on here. This is actually the, first, uh, the cover for the first issue. So. It's a, a world that I don't think you've seen anything quite like before. So if you're in stuff that's, you know, a lot of uh, fun, action, adventure, in you know, a way you've not really seen depicted, it could be your favorite new comic. <laughs> Tough. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's super good. I'm sure but it's awesome. But you're totally wrong, though. Like, I checked the internet. I Googled it. I mean, we, you're do, wrong. we do have the notable advantage of not having Ryan Brown on it, which is pretty a big up for any book. <laughs> Ryan Brown, if you were here, uh, I missed it. I missed That's it. true. Even, even after the month in the van, I still miss it. Right? He's a good dude. Do you still have his scent on you? Uh, we tried not to give each other scent on each other too much. It was, I mean, it was like, it was it was like a van. month in a van. Like, it was really hard not to. Choice. It sort of happened involuntarily. But, we, you know, I don't know. I, yes, I had his scent up here, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a Stockholm Center thing going. So, uh, both Charles and Justin, you have the benefit of working with just about every major comic publisher under the sun. Uh, you know, Justin, you've done Sombra with Boom. You've done, uh, you know, you've worked over with DC. You've done uh, Evil Learning. Uh, Charles, you've worked with Big Two. Uh, you've done Strange Attractors through Boom. You've just finished Letter 44 with uh, Bodoni. Uh, what do you think it is about Image that sets it apart from all the other, you know, publishers on the market? Uh, do you want to, I mean, I got plenty to say on that, but I'm sure you do too. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, the big draw is the complete and creative freedom of it. There is, you can do anything you want in Image. Nobody says, no, you can't do that. And that ranges from both the content of the books to even what the books are. If I wanted to do one that was like, 
every page was a different variant cover for like chromium with eye cutouts and all that kind of stuff. Image would probably let me. We wouldn't make any money and they'd be angry <laughs> after we went well into the red, but they'd probably say yes. Um, and you don't get that anywhere else. And it's the same thing as you reap essentially all the rewards of doing it creatively. If a book does well, uh, the creative team gets the vast, vast majority of it. And it's the same way if something goes to movie rights or anything like that, that's yours. Um, and it is yours to say yes or no to, so you can completely steward the future of a book. Um, and that's, you know, that's also a lot of pressure, but it is the great appeal of Image, is that they will let you do all that. And it doesn't hurt that Image books, uh, they have a reputation, so now they tend to sell reasonably well, so, you know, the money's good, oftentimes. Yeah, I, I mean, all of that is true. I think for me, the, one of the biggest, um, the biggest attractions to image that image image is a is a comic publisher. You know, they're not in the business of trying to trying to make movies or make TV shows out of out of properties. They're not in the in the business of taking percentages of your of your property for the privilege of publishing your comic. Like it's all all of the other companies. As much as I've enjoyed working with with all of them, um, there's this there's this assumption that you have to give away a chunk of your of your creative ownership in order to get the work published as a comic. And image doesn't do that and seems to be doing just fine which begs the question of why the other ones insist that they have to do it that way. So I, um, you know, it's not to say that I'll never work with other companies again, but it's just pretty darn solid by me, as far as that goes. So Andrew, you, and, and Meredith, you both do fantasy books very deeply set in the fantasy world. Meredith, I feel like if there's any character that kind of speaks, mainstream character that speaks to fantasy, it's Wonder Woman, so you are very comfortable when you have done uh, Grim Fairy Tales. What, what is it about that genre that really that you guys really dig, and what sets your books apart from the rest of that genre? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I've always loved fantasy, even when I was a kid, but specifically with, uh, with Headlopper, I wanted something to be just uh, purely fun. So I, as much as I love, you know, say like the Lord of the Rings or whatever, <coughs> that it takes its, Lord of the Rings takes itself like super seriously. And I wanted something that felt more like, uh, like when I was a kid I used to love watching uh, uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger play Conan. I loved watching uh, The Clash of the Titans and, and, and anything Ray Harryhausen had really touched. And, uh, and that, those are the things, those, you know, those kind of fantasy movies from the 80s are like crawl, stuff like that. Made me really want to make a comic to like, yeah, leave, leave, right? Exactly. And so I wanted to make a comic that kind of felt like that, you know, that was um, that was like adventure, you know, more than anything. And uh, and I also wanted to do something that was relatively simple, so that the the fantasy genre is so heavily trodden. Like I kind of decide to embrace a lot of the, uh, you know, the still appropriate kind of tropes and cliches and stuff, and then put my, just my own flavor or taste or spin on them so much. So it's like, I don't spend a lot of time defining how magic works in the world and all this stuff. It's, it's kind of, the world itself is pretty familiar. So then I can have, it's like, it's a shorthand in a way. So then all my, my characters can be where it's, uh, where it becomes special. So uh, that's where I think some of the humor comes in and some of the, I also always felt like so, so often in, in fantasy stuff, my favorite characters were like a side character that we'd meet for like 10 minutes or something. And I was like, that guy was like the coolest character in the whole book, you know? And uh, why are we watching this <coughs> clean shaven, you know, uh, you know, perfectly no no flaws type character. You know, save a princess again. You know, I was like, where where does that guy go now? So like, Norgal is kind of my character for that, and and then of course Agatha, she's a talking severed head. So so it's like, you know, I find what's new in in what the characters kind of do, and also there's there's so much like stuff that I really love that was a lot of uh, pulp stories and stuff like uh, Fawford and the Grey Mouser, and these are all, you know. Uh, or even the original Conan stories, they're not, they don't take themselves seriously. And so uh, I kind of tap into that and try to find excuses to draw some just really strange monsters and uh, you know, get my characters into trouble. And hopefully it finds its own identity, and I think it does, but that's not for me to judge.
I think it's also really helped by your style. Your art style is just like so unique and cool and like Thanks. alive. Uh, yeah, I think that's the other thing is when we when we read fa fantasy, we op we often expect like super high detailed type stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, I just want it to be fun. I, I don't I don't want it to be necessarily. Your, your like, shirt and your hat are like is your shirt your stuff too? No, no, it's not. But like that's it. <laughs> I'm super into like that's the other thing too is I'm really into like heavy metal and fantasy is all over heavy metal. Mm -hmm. So like I kind of one of the other things like I want it to be like I feel like Arnold playing Conan. Clash of the Titans, and I wanted to make a book that has nothing to do with music, but you'd be like, oh, this is, this book is metal. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted to have that feel without, with no guitars, no singing, nothing. Cool. Yeah. Just to walk away and be like, dude, that's brutal. Be like, that's brutal. Yeah. <coughs> do you like listen to Eyes to Earth while you're drawing things? Oh, I used to, but I burned those records out. I can't listen to it anymore. But I do listen to like a lot of, uh, Listen to like a lot of Blind Guardian. That's super power metal. I listen to a lot of like Symphony X. That's that's very power metally, and and then uh, you know bands like Mastodon or Red Fang and stuff. How do you feel about a Casey Strain? Uh, okay. Yeah. No, not my jam. That's so, good. Respect. Um. I feel like I'm in the wrong crowd right now. I don't listen to metal music. No, I have. I'm like, what are they saying? Like foreign language. Right? Listen to other stuff. Let's talk about it. Dave would know. Dave would know about it. But do not, not shut up, Justin. Shut up your face. I'm I'm writing fantasy because that's what I grew up reading, and um, David would constantly push comic books at me, and I'd be like, it's not really my thing, which is I think why. Um, Getting into comics through writing Grimm's fairy tales was a really appropriate way for me to, to start my career because that's kind of, it's really what I love. And Wonder Woman, when I think of what character I would have written other than her, I can't think of one, simply because she, I really, we really approached her from her Greek mythology and the fantastical aspect of her universe. And one of my favorite things about fantasy is that it's not a one and done. As a general rule, you get these huge, Robert Jordan, I think he wrote 12 books or something like that, and each book is like 10,000 pages. Wheel like they're enormous. Thing, yes. Yeah, the Wheel like, of Time. I love. Yeah, and me too. Those are my favorite books to read because you really get to know the characters and and, and you invest in somebody. You don't want them to be gone at, in one book. And once I was in comics and I was writing, and I always thought I would write a fantasy book, but after I got off Wonder Woman, I'm like that. I'm not going to write a fantasy book, I'm going to write a fantasy comic because the great thing about comics is that you can just keep going. You can develop your story and spread out your characters and, and give people, you could do a one shot where you get to, to focus on like this obscure character that people really love. And, and comics, fantasy fits comics because it's so beautifully visual and you can do stuff in a comic that you couldn't necessarily do on TV, although you know Game of Thrones puts that to lie, but but I, I feel they like there's a huge budget too. They do. <laughs> I can do a lot for a little in a comic book, and and I feel like that's that's really why I, I, I'm doing what I'm doing now because it's my way. I always say, and I think I said this when we did our review that this is my love letter to fantasy fiction, and and uh, it's why I'm doing. It. Whenever people ask me when it's done, I'm like. Never. <laughs> I'm never going to be finished because the idea of fantasy is that you can just keep getting deeper into that world. Now, Charles, with your previous two uh, creator on books, Strange Attractors, Layer 44, they were very science fiction. You know, uh, aliens, uh, crazy man, apocalyptic man. With, uh, with curse words, you're going full tilt boogie on magic. Yep. And madcap magic at yep. that. Gonzo magic. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> what made you want to kind of change gears and, and lean into that? Um, a lot of it for me was that, um, have I mentioned how talented Brian Brown is as a comedic visual storyteller? Um, because he really is. He can, he can sell a gag like nobody. And we wanted to, to do something. So, so for example, I'll give you an example of a, uh, of a Ryan Brown gag. So he'll, if you ever get a chance to ask him for a commission, get a commission. And, and just, say, just say, do whatever you want, and then he'll do something. And he did... Um, he did, let's see what a couple that he did. He did a picture of um, Batman and Robin, except it's Boatman and Robin, and so they're like nautically themed Batman and Robin. <laughs> and he did, um, 
a picture of the Punisher, except his guns, like he's got pistols, except they're baby alligators, and he's just like <laughs> shooting them somehow. And it's funny, it's very funny. And it's just, you don't know what's gonna happen next. And so I wanted to give, I wanted to write a story with Ryan that would allow him to do things that were complete nonsense, but then could be made into something that made sense because of magic. Like you could, you could have a person shooting alligators, which I actually put into an issue because I'd seen his Punisher commission. Um, there's a point where there's a bunch of machine gun people, uh, not li they're not people who are machine guns, they're people holding machine guns. <laughs> and, uh, and Wizard, our main character, uh, turns all their guns into alligators because I knew Ryan could nail it because I'd seen it, I'd seen it done, and he did. So magic gives us a chance to, to so there's a, so I'll, I'll write a script and then he will, he will draw it and then I will realize what he's done or added or changed to the script. Uh, and then I will go back and re often re-dialogue or adjust it based on what he's done to, to bring out characters that we didn't, um, you know, neither one of us knew would exist uh, when I wrote the script. So, for example, there's a, the, the wizard character, he comes here from a place called the Whole World, H-O-L-E World, Whole World, it's like a pun or something. And there's, there's a big spread, a uh, big double spread where you see kind of this, this beautiful fantasy place and there's a, there's like this frog, this huge frog, a 20 foot tall frog dude with a hat on, and he's like hosting a stein, hoisting a stein of beer. And I didn't make that guy up. Ryan just put he him really, in. He really stood out too. I love that the character. The drunk frog? Yeah, we all, everybody loves a drunk frog. Yeah. But then there's, you, there's a point where you see the whole world like flash forward, like centuries, millennia, and it's turned into this dark, terrible, dystopic place. But the drunk frog is still alive. Except, um, I was like, well, okay, it's been a long time, everything's terrible now, so what's happened is that he's now chained to the rock or the tree where he was, and his mug is still there, but it's like, just out of his reach. He can't reach it, and he's so sad now. And so, now there's all this, this yeah, it's a bummer. So now there's all this, this story about, you, you know, thousands of years of this poor drunk frog's life. Uh, so now he's a sober frog. Yeah. Started drunk, ended up sober. Uh, that is just because Ryan Brown drew him once. And, and that is... Um, why, to answer your actual question, uh, why we decided to make a book about magic, to allow things more like that to, to happen, and that would feel like, okay, it works within the rules of the book. Um, so, yeah, pretty much that. Two more questions to uh, Justin, and, and to Nikki as well. Your, your previous books really lean more into horror, like really bloody, bloody mur murder, um, dude gets his head cleaved and loses his throat, spoilers. Um, the spread is basically, if the thing from the thing won, what made you want to go kind of swashbuckling fun with the family trade? Because I hadn't. <laughs> uh, and no, that's kind of the thing, like, uh, over the course of my career, if you look at, like, what I've done, like, I was talking about this earlier this week, like, in terms of, like, the Justin Jordan brand, it's probably a bad idea because I just do new stuff to keep myself interested in what I'm writing, which is also, also the reason that most of my stuff doesn't go a very long time. It's sort of the reason it's like, well, we did 18 issues of Strobe, I'm like, well, that's the story, right? So we're, we're done. So when we were coming up to Family Trade, like, yeah, I wanted to try something that's very different. And this is, you know, the first book that we could probably ethically offer to teenagers without <laughs> running the risk of being arrested in Kentucky. So, you know, we've gone back and forth. And yeah, most of the appeal for me was actually doing something that was unlike the stuff that I had done before, which is kind of how my creator own stuff is going in general. Nikki, I don't know if you wanted to. I got nothing right now. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, the whole book started as a joke uh, between Justin and I. Because um, most of the stories that I've written have also been, like, a horror, horror based. Everybody dies. It's all very terrible. Um, Which could still happen. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. Um, but this started as a joke because uh, he asked me how my cousin was doing. And I told him that she was in Barcelona. And Justin then discovered that my family is full of assassins and thieves. The family trade. So, yeah, because we're all, it's just what you do. It's just what you do when you're in my family, you know? I'm just gonna kill people. Uh, so that went on and it snowballed into this fantastic book with amazing art. Yeah, I will tell you, my, my next two image books both began as jokes, which is not, not, not a negative image comics thing. Uh, family trade is not a, it, it's a funny book, but it's not a joke book. It's not, you know, it, it's not that kind of a book. My other one is Death of Love, and Death of Love actually began as a joke about a dude taking a, a chainsaw to a Cupid. Mm -hmm. uh, and an artist friend of mine did that as his warm-up, and I thought it was awesome looking. I said, you want to do a book? And then a book happened. <laughs> so that's how the magic happens, kids. That's the image comics play. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love about both the books, um, 
especially uh, when it comes to head lopper and, and curse words, you guys really have a very kind of prodigious use of color, very bright, very striking, very neon. How did that all kind of come about? I mean, kind of, we had seen comics go kind of dark and gritty, and you guys kind of like really lighten things up. Um, for me, the, um, well, the, the first head lopper arc is very, uh, it's all kind of set on an island that's kind of based on Scotland, so it's very green, very gray, and muted and everything, but a lot of the a lot of the art that I like is is brighter colors, and uh, so when I when I switched to the the current arc where we go, I designed it. It's very video game inspired, but I also so I got tired of drawing gray and green and rocks and hills and stuff. So come the second arc, I designed a world where there's much more magic, so I can basically do whatever, draw whatever I want. Same kind of idea, and so there's all these like kind of like gates and these portals and stuff and, and a series of trials so each time someone goes through a door uh, they're in a totally kind of surreal fictional place because I was tired of drawing uh, our planet and um, and so I and I switched colors at that point to Jordi Blair and she's fantastic with like subtleties within palettes and so each little world is uh, the, the kind of like the reason they go through is they need to go very fantasy style. They need to, each world has a crystal eye to to like a big stone automaton, and they need to get there's four heads to this automaton, so they need to get all the crystal eyes. So each crystal eye is a different color, and so that world is themed this color. So I was like, Jordy, let's this world this behind this door, it's a blue world. That that behind that door, it's an orange world or whatever, and so. I knew Jordy was great with subtlety within themes and palettes, and I wanted something that was bright and surreal and, and like psychedelic, and so we we ran with that, and it it stands as a nice contrast to uh, magic was much lighter in volume one of Headlopper than in volume two. So bringing all that magic and having a more psychedelic world really, and then having Jordy really lent itself to having brighter, more psych psychedelic colors. But uh, I'm just, I'm a fan of those colors. Like, I love, um, one of my favorite artists is this guy Skinner, and he he doesn't really make comics, but he does a lot of like painting, or it's almost like like air like airbrushing, and then like ink drawing on top, and it's just like neon monsters. Like everything's neon monsters, and it's just, it's amazing. And, it's, and I, I wanted to steal that from Skinner and, <laughs> and incorporate it in my own world. And then my friend, my friend uh, Alexis Sarit, he makes a comic called Space Riders, and everything he does is just really flat, simple, super bright palettes, and I'm just, <coughs> it's, I'm just really into that. So I kind of wrote my story for volume two in a way that can accommodate all that, that kind of visually uh, electric uh, scenery. It's pretty similar for, I mean, Ryan Brown uh, handles the, the, the art on, on the book. Um, we've had a number of different colorists, but uh, the, the final pass before it goes to press is always Ryan going over and, and, and repainting, like doing touch-ups. And usually what he does, there's a, there's a, I don't know, so you're, you're the art person, so I'm going to ask you an art person question. Shoot. There's like a little thing you can do on Photoshop to like crank it up, right? Like there's yep. a little dial. So he just basically takes the dial and goes, Arr! Um, yeah, you can turn up like the saturation. Of the yeah, he says that word sometimes. I so think that's, that was, that's one that's of them. It. Um, yeah, he tries to explain his techniques sometimes. And there's things like color holds and spotting. Like there's all these terms. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, but it, it's also it's a, it's a magical. It's a, it's a phosphorescent uh, psychedelic world that, that has a lot of, of. You want it to feel like a very heightened reality. And color is one of the many storytelling tools you can use to do that. Uh, we also play with a lot of, um, you know, like fantasy tropes and curse words, and one of them is the idea that there are there are nine evil wizards. Wizard is, is one of nine. Uh, there's also a hog tour named Botchko. There's, um, there's a little kid named Silly Bee. There, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> but they each, uh, they each are powered by a, a, a different gemstone, and they each have a different color associated with them. So Wizard's color is blue. He likes sapphires. Uh, his, his ex, Ruby Stitch, he uses rubies. Uh, Botchko the Hogtor uses chocolate diamonds. Um, there's a bunch of different ones. And so all of those color cues are represented in the book um, through through the work that, that Ryan and the various colorists do. The current guy is Addison Duke, who's awesome. So uh, it's, uh, it's just another really important lettering. Like every tool is part of the overall effect in any comic. And 
certainly we had live on cursors. Yeah, and it works as a great, sorry, it works no as a great like storytelling thing too. Mm -hmm. And I have, to, this is all credit to Jordy and it's, it's, a, it's a, a level of attention that I couldn't have imagined. Like I'll tell Jordy, for example, like, oh, this world is like purple, but feel free to like go like pinks or something. And she'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. And then she'll be like, she'll be like, I'm saving the pinks. And she'll, she'll go, the, the beginning of that scene or whatever will be like, super purple and then you go as the drama like deepens or the stakes mm -hmm. increase it'll get pinker and pinker and pinker and it's like like you could really zero in on it, on it and use color as part of a storytelling tool it's yep. like absolutely it's much more yeah. versatile than i even imagined until i really got to work with Johnny. even Martin. like everything down to like fonts you know like every yep. every aspect of the comic is is part of the storytelling it creates the effect for the reader so I'm just lucky I get to work with people who know how to do all that stuff because I do not. Which kind of leads me you, you guys have kind of touched on your relationship really big and you with Morgan for the family trade and certainly with, uh, with Trad on Luther Strode and John on, on Spread. What kind of relationship do you have collaboratively with your, with your art teams? Um, I'm very lucky with Ig. Uh, after the first issue, I just, you know when you work with an artist that you're in sync with. and. I've been very fortunate. I've had I've worked with a couple of artists where it didn't, I didn't work that well, well but uh, I've been very fortunate in most of the, the major story arcs that I've done to have that. And uh, so I just write stuff like, hey, I know you're going to knock this out of the park. I really need a sad, like, somebody just died on that. And but that, like these guys were saying, that goes onward into the colors and to the letters that when I talked to Triona a lot about what we were going to do for colors when we were first starting the book and how this is a very dead, barren land that's dying and Rose is the light, she's the hope and so all of her her pages she should have a little bit of greenness to, to the landscape and, and what you see around her and it should be brighter when she's around versus everybody else because she is the hope of the land and you see that reflected um, that she has a very blue palette for our evil queen and, and rose has a very rich light palette um, yeah I, I feel like if you have a really good relationship with your artist then it's your job as a writer to give them uh, parameters to work within and then just set them free the really great art they're visual storytellers I come up with a story, but it's their job to tell it visually, and, and it's my job to get out of their way. Yeah, I've been really lucky uh, on my image books in particular that the art teams have all done really well. Which, like, for instance, with, with Strode, it was I approached Trad through Deviant Art and did not know each other at all. And we ended up, we think about how to tell stories really similarly. Me and Trad and Felipe have the hive mind, as we refer to it, we are almost always in agreement about everything. Um, and that actually, that, that, that's good. But there's a downside to that is that actually sort of set in my mind what the <laughs> template for a working relationship should be, and it isn't always. Uh, but I've been really fortunate on most of my image stuff on when I'm working with John Bivens. Like John, who's the artist on Spread right now, John and I actually worked together like 10, 11 years ago. We actually did a Zuda entry back in 2006, 2007. So we've known each other a long time. Zuda. Right? Yes, I've that one a long time. And, uh, Morgan, <laughs> and, I, and I've known Morgan for five or six years now too, which also helps. We, it's important, you don't have to get along with the artist <laughs> in our team, but it really helps to have somebody you grew up with because if you get along, you communicate well. And, and the key part of an artist-writer relationship is the communication going both ways. Your ability to describe what your intention is. And, them to pick up on it and tell you what their intention is. And that's, you know, that's the key thing. And it's when I'm putting together an art team, that's actually a thing I consider. There's there's artists who I think are super rad, and I've looked at their social media, and I'm like, I don't think I can work with this person. Like, because this exists forever. Unless we legally sever ourselves, this project, even if it only goes five issues or one issue or whatever, that's a lifetime own the company. That is a relationship that exists till one of us dies. Uh, so, be your first, don't worry. Right, I'm, well, I'm sure I'm a thousand years older than the rest of you. So, I'll take care of it, it's fine. Yeah, and Nikki's gonna kill me, so, you know. Uh, so, you know, but it's, it's important that when you're going into an art thing to look at more than just the art, right? Like, the dynamic of what you think the, the work is gonna be like as a process 
is also important, especially on creator own stuff, because like I said, that's a thing that you're gonna have to deal with for a long damn time. I absolutely love working with Morgan too, because she's, everything we've given her has been just on point. Like, she has nailed every, every part of it. Um, and they're these beautiful, beautiful watercolors that remind you kind of like a French indie comic kind of thing. And it's just, it's just it's spot on. Love it, love it. And um, Morgan lets me like torture her. I'll send her very, very complicated, uh, like pictures of chapels, stained glass, <laughs> like on a regular basis. And I'm like, hey, we're gonna have to put this in the comic, uh, in the, like now. So if you get on that, art slave, <laughs> do this now. Um, Remember, you don't always have to get along with your artist. <laughs> <laughs> but she's pretty, she's pretty good natured about it. Just get an emoji that's middle finger back, and it's, it's all set. That's all right. Yeah. So the cool thing is the first volume of Headlopper, which I was at New York Comic Con, I have to work the image booth every now and again. They call it Headloper. Oh, I get it all the time. Just, just, anyway, yeah. so the first volume of Headlopper and the first volume of Curse Words are both out. You guys are both in the middle of your second arc. What is it about the second arc that you're trying to tr trying to explore, trying to differentiate from the first? Um, I want I try to um, sort of in the tradition of like some older fantasy where it was like, uh, you know, uh, short stories in like pulp magazines and stuff. Like, uh, like the original Conan stuff, it's, they're short stories, they exist on their own. Um, sometimes you get an idea of where things fall chron chronologically, or like, I love the, fu the Fuffer and the Grey Mauser stuff, those are all specifically chronological, but you could read, you know, the 13th story of Fuffer and the Grey Mauser and you're gonna enjoy it as much as anything else, like you don't need the origin at all. So I really want to try to have each arc exist in, in a new setting, uh, reward reward uh, basically uh, readers who have continued throughout, um, and yet at the same time not alienate anyone either. I want things to be, I want each individual uh, issue, which is why they come out quarterly so I can make them bigger and I have time to tell individual stories. I want each little installment along the way to have a be very satisfying always so each arc here in the second arc i've taken like uh like a character or two from the original arc that was super side story didn't tell you anything about him i've dragged them along and so where we didn't learn anything before but we met them you'll be rewarded in the second uh being a continuing reader uh, but you don't need that. So I try to do that and visually change the setting altogether, introduce new characters. Again, just I want it to feel episodic that builds up to something else. Partly for, I, I just know how I am with Reader. I can't remember everything a character ever said. And, uh, and also I just love that about some of the uh, kind of pulp fantasy stuff. So there's always going to be, hopefully, a big, a big change for each arc. Uh, I, I mean, Curse Wars is, is similar. You want to expand the focus. I mean, in the in the first arc of the series, which was um, uh, called The Devil's Devil, uh, it, it really focused primarily on Wizard, uh, Margaret, who is his, his koala familiar who talks, and uh, Ruby Stitch, who is his, his ex-girlfriend, who is also a super mean wizard who is sent from the whole world to kill him in New York City. And so it was really about that trio, establishing who they were, establishing what they wanted, um, bringing people in with a set of relationships they could easily understand while referring to a deeper world, but not necessarily seeing too much of it. And then the second arc has been about showing, showing readers that, that stuff that we kind of hinted at. So you get to meet the other nine evil wizards, or the, uh, the rest of the nine evil wizards. You um, learn more about kind of how the rest of the world is reacting to the fact that this wizard has popped up. Just, just different stuff like that. And, and the thing that's interesting too is that I, I tend to break and plot an arc of a, of a book all at once, so whether it's six issues, five issues, whatever it is, like I kind of put it all together. Uh, and when you're starting something new, you do all that without having any sense of what people are going to like, what people are going to react to, and you 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 use your story sense and your your experience to hopefully make stuff that people will dig. But then when it starts being out in the world, you realize well, people really thought, you know, people really glommed on to Margaret a lot. And so I had this plan to um, to so Margaret begins as a koala, but it, because it's a book about magic, she can change it. She can change it into different animals, and she changes into an eagle, uh, and then um, she changes into a platypus. And this was the source of the largest argument that Ryan and I have had about curse words so far, because he was, people loved Koala Margaret, loved, and still do, to this very day, I think they still love Koala Margaret. And I was, 
I was like, well, you know, the story really demands that you become a platypus man. And he's like, well, <laughs> but a platypus isn't as like adorable. A, a koala is like a little baby almost, and like people like that. And why are you why are you doing this? You're gonna kill the book. Um, furry ducks. How is that not adorable? That was I, I thought he so. was wrong. I also think that there's um, there's value in well. And that one, poison claw. Well, that's the thing. So the poison claw. <laughs> Uh, it turns out that uh, female platypi or whatever platypuses don't have it. Well, they have it at birth, but as they grow older, they lose it. It's like a puberty thing. Right. So they don't. They don't have it. And but I wanted it because I was gonna like write action sequences revolving around the poison claw. So technically, now Margaret is a transgender platypus. I think. I don't know. I mean, magic. Magic. That's just you explain the poison claw way that way. Like. Yeah. Magic. I have ha Maybe she has like a little poison claw in her pouch because she's a marsupial. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. The, 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 the point is that I was pretty sure that it would work. That it would work to change a, a, a beloved element of the book into something else. Let it evolve. Let the story send it somewhere else. And we really haven't gotten a lot of, you know, hate mail about it. a little bit. Sure. People people send hate mail about like anything. So. Yeah, these days. So, it, but it, it, you know, I think the story needs to go where the story goes, and, and you need to let the story tell you where it needs to go. And in this case, it, it definitely was saying platypus, no matter what Ryan Brown thought. And guess what? She's a platypus. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Winner take all. So, speaking of, of cute, uh, cute elements, both Rose and uh, and the family trade kind of pr prominently featured felines. What was it that made you want to kind of throw in that? Uh, that element into both your stories. We got well, to put our cats in our book. Yeah, I have a cat who's probably more famous than I am at this point, so obviously I needed to capitalize on that. I gotta keep her fed so she can start pulling her weight by being in the comic book. He actually has a tip jar on the table that's the Tom Waits tip jar, and literally has made more money than him this weekend. That's true. Tom Tom is out this weekend. Just, you know. But she's the brains of the operation, so it works out. But yeah, it was just that. It was just, I could, and it was, you know, we could, and it was an idea. So in the family trade, the Toms are intelligent, but they speak cat. So you, you, Jessica does not speak cat. She's the only person in her family. She speaks like eight human languages, but she can't speak cat. It's the only one she can't quite. It's the only one she can't grasp. Uh, so on this island, the cats are actually like the spy network, and they're involved in everything, because they're everywhere. Uh, so it, it served a narrative purpose that was kind of cool and kind of different to uh, have talking cats, although the reader can't understand them either. You just get the other human side of the conversation. Um, so we thought it would be, you know, thought it would be cool and be something that would distinct, uh, make the book more distinct from, you know, other books. So, and, and we could put our cats in it. I, kind of the same thing for me. Uh, the, the book originally started, um, Dave did some Noman DVDs um, years ago, and the, the, her familiar was going to be a mechanical horse. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't know, I just couldn't get behind the mechanical horse. I love horses, but it was metal and it wasn't very warm. And I was, then I was like, oh, maybe I'll do dragons because I love Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Perm series. There's this like show out right now that's got a white-haired girl with a dragon. And I was like, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> now people are going to think I'm copying. It's like, well, what can I do? And then, um, Rob McKinley did a book, um, Forgotten Beasts of Elves, and I was rereading it at the time, and there's a couple of cats in that book, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. Like, I love the idea of, because um, they're, aunt, cats have this <coughs> to them that I think works really well, and, and, and you don't want to mess with them. And I felt like that actually ultimately ended up being a really good balance for this naive young girl to have this great big huge, and I was like, I described to Egg, I'm like, I want saber tooth tiger cat, like I want him to be bad, like a badass cat, and so that's what we have. And cats are amazing. So they are. Mm -hmm. it's a, I'm always more of a cat person. Yeah. Dogs are fun. Anyway. My cat always tries to like kill me at night. Like she'll sleep like right on my neck, mm. and sometimes she'll just like slowly start to like slide the pillow over my face and hold it down. <laughs> so and she's like, she might be kind. She she loves you with her purrs. But you would die happy. I would. I would it's like very very comfy because the fur is there. Yeah, just... it comes from a place of feline love. <laughs> yeah. So I, I feel like 
this wouldn't be complete if I didn't go down the line and just ask, what are you guys geeking out over? Um, I'm geeking out over, uh, I, can't, I can't stop, it's, it's really bad, uh, I can't stop geeking out over uh, Miyazaki's uh, Nausicaa manga. I, uh, I read it earlier this year, I hadn't seen the movie, I read it, I fell in love, watched the movie, and then pretty much uh, just started over. I just, the current arc, and I can, I can tell there's at least one monster that I'm planning for the third arc, and that is so Miyazaki. I, I can feel it. I, I can't stop thinking about that, that comic, that, that manga, you know. It's, it's just beautiful. I'm geeking out about the fact that my kids are finally back in school, actually. <laughs> yes! <laughs> because I could not, well, I'm sorry, I could not work all summer long, and so this whole month I'm like, the kids are back in school. The kids are back in school. I, I have no time to be reading comics and, and watching TV right now because I just want to get my own book out the door. <laughs> and then the kids out the door. So now that they're out the door, is there, now any, that, is there anything that you kind of glommed onto? Look, I love The 100, which we talked about. Of course. Yeah. Um, it's a good I, I love Game of Thrones. I was like, no, two more years till the next season. I love, like, if it's fantasy, I love it, so, yeah, and those are my favorite, but now I'm just suffering for the next little while. I think the 100 comes back, but it's not going to be enough. It's There's always not. Chef's Table. There is always Chef's Table. I, yeah. can, I can put that on in the background. Uh, let's see, there's a couple <laughs> things. Um, I, I've really, really been enjoying uh, John Hickman, Jonathan Hickman's Black Mummy Murders comic. I think it's just phenomenally... Uh, like creative and, and ambitious in a way that comics don't, you know, don't often always stretch for, and I'm just very impressed with it and uh, what he's trying to do and the things he's talking about. It's really, really good. Um, I, to to my schedule's chagrin, I got really, I really enjoyed the, um, the the new Zelda game, Breath of the Wild. Like you can just play that forever, like it never stops, and it's just always kind of this soothing, beautiful experience. Um, that, and then as far as other media stuff, I, I loved the Twin Peaks reboot this summer. I thought it was yes. like an unreserved home run, even though it was very challenging and sort of like, like David Lynch was kind of screwing with you the whole time. It was just very, very, very good. Um, there's a show called The Expanse I like a lot, um, and a bunch of different stuff. I, I don't have as much time as I'd like, you know, to, to consume, but I try to, try to stay up on things as much as I can. Were you a big Lynch fan outside of Twin Peaks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he, I think he does whatever the hell he wants, and fortunately he's, he's a genius. And it's, it's not like, you know, there's a lot of geniuses who do whatever the hell they want, but nobody's kind of paying attention. And, and he's able to have some, like, he has this kind of national stage or international stage to, to create these visions, and it's really neat to see what he does. I just, I couldn't believe how good that Twin Peaks was. We should probably, you got a novel coming out soon too, don't you? Uh, yeah, my first novel is called The Oracle Year. It comes out in April. Um, from HarperCollins, which is very cool. It's like a big, real deal book, hardcover, everything. Um, it's about a guy who can see the future and the way that the world immediately goes nuts when a guy who can see the future pops up, who actually can do it. Uh, he starts selling predictions, um, so that throws governments and religion and pop culture and everything into complete disarray. And so the book is sort of about both, both the way the world reacts to kind of being able to sort of know the future and also uh, this guy and who he is and why he's doing it and how he knows what he knows. So um, I actually have a preview of the first three chapters, like a little booklet, uh, at my table in Artist Alley this weekend, table 24 or 7. If you want to swing by, I'll just give it to you. I'll just give it to you. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about it because prose is something I've wanted to do since I was really little. And I just hope, I just hope it works. You know, like it's, I've, it's been years of work. You know, comics are relatively quick. You know, you do a comic and it's kind of out. And, you know, this is, this is years and years of effort to put this thing into the world. And I, I guess I'll find out. You know, what are you going to do? better than not putting it out, right? Uh, I just recently discovered a podcast called uh, Wooden Trench Coats. It's about two competing funeral parlors. Uh, <laughs> pretty much all I do is sit around and watch Netflix and Hulu, so there's it's like a list that no one really wants. Anything in particular on Netflix and or Hulu that you've been... Um, I found a very fantastic Australian sitcom called Late. Uh, this girl, anytime she sleeps with someone, she finds out all of her ex-boyfriends are dying. Uh, systematically, and she's trying to figure out why she's like her vagina has been cursed. So does that make her want to sleep with more people? Uh, or she tries people? to sleep with the guy who can heal people with his dick, <laughs> um, but he looks like a weird version of like a zombie Heath Ledger. 
Uh, so like Does it's, that make it hotter or? It's, uh, no, because I mean like okay. the heat lighter hotness is there, but he's kind of like got this film on him. Sure, and right. His teeth are like green. So like presumably like he felt like you're actually like right now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a literal sexual. Too thing. dark. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm on board. Too Justin. Uh, but more than anything, like Family Trade is my first comic, so I've been kind of freaking out. Sure. Behind closed doors, obviously. Of course. Uh, of course. Crying every now and then because I'm like, what is this? This video won't make it online. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, I'm pretty, pretty stoked about that. So that's ramble on. Just to start talking, please. Bojack Horseman. Uh, I made the mistake one day. So when I first got into Bojack Horseman, it was the first three seasons were already out. And I made the mistake of binging the first three seasons, which I don't know if you've watched Bojack Horseman, but that is playing Russian roulette with your own life because it is a soul destroying show. And watching it back to back for three seasons is just going to put you into a spiral. But um, this last season of Bojack Horseman managed the impressive trick of being depressing in a completely different way. <laughs> Uh, and it's amazing, it's a, you know, it's a show which features talking animals mixing with humans and it manages, manages to bring more pathos out of what's going on and be a more true portrait of what depression and self-loathing is like than almost anything else that's coming out right now. It's, it's sort of amazing in the depth that they get, especially if you've watched the show in general, the first three quarters of the first season are alright, but they're not Bojack Horseman. That's all I've watched, actually. I yeah, just, I, I, I Once you get past that, that, though, there's this goal. Really? Like, right. Yeah. Like, if, and that's why I didn't watch it initially. I was like, yeah. well, whatever. But then people really know it, it gets really good, and it does. Um, and, and so this last season, you get to this point where usually in every season, and this is kind of a meta spoiler, the next to the last episode is like the heavy hitter. It's the one that will devastate you. Uh, Game of Thrones does that, too. The big action episode is usually the last one, the one before the last of the season. This one managed to do a thing where it recontextualizes everything you've seen in the season to date. Like, just the cohesive writing of it was really impressive from a craft standpoint. I, was, I wanted to watch the season, I haven't had time, to watch the season again just to see what they had layered in there. Cause, a lot. Yeah, I once you get it, right? Netflix all yeah. the time, that's all I do. Once you get it, you're like, oh, oh, I didn't understand a whole lot of stuff that was going on. It's a very good sleight of hand, so I've been mildly obsessed. Rick and Morty's kind of like that, too. Right? Oh, yeah, Rick and Morty's, Morty's great. great. Yeah. <laughs> Than it has like it really should be, and then yeah. they're like, holy fuck. Yeah, it's <laughs> unbelievably this season. Sure. Rick and Morty is a way better got, show than it should be. It got really dark really quick there too. Yeah. Like, the Nine Inch Nails hurt the plan. I was just like, oh yeah. Ah. So do you have to take Rick Lannis episode? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah that's have really to watch good. an episode of BoJack right after you're done, or do you have to like emotionally cleanse and then jump into the next one? No, but this time I was able to uh, able to power through and I watched it over like three nights, which is probably wise. But it's one of those things where like, I've always joked that if you watch like Dark Room for a Dream and then Grave of the Fireflies, it's just a suicide solution. You might as well just watch <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a brown note that just destroys minds because they're just too depressing. And Bojack Horseman's kind of that way because at some point in the whole season you're like, Bojack, no. <laughs> because at any point, he's almost a good person. And it's the almost that makes it tragic. You're like, oh, man. Now, uh, I guess to kind of close out, do uh, you have a question? Or? Yeah, but you can finish your thoughts. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, um, <laughs> does anybody, uh, I was just going to have everybody go down the line and say what table number they're at so these fine folks can, can find them and check out their wares. Uh, a, a nine, I don't know. Two, nine five oh three maybe or maybe two five oh three. He's, he's sure. right across from Iron Fist. Yeah, I, I'm right across from uh, like the the uh, photo op booth. Uh, is that, is that yeah, well, the Iron Fist isn't the uh, Finn Jones. He is Finn Jones. That's what I heard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was uh, Colleen Lynn. Oh, they both. Oh, oh. That was wrong. Oh, yeah. yeah, Iron Fist is here. Cool. I'm right across from Iron Fist. That's all. <laughs> That's all I know. I don't know my booth number. But I know that Finn Jones is signed. They're right there. In front Have of you me. seen him? No. Oh, okay. All right. No. <laughs> uh, I'm in booth two four zero seven. Two four zero seven is the comic sketcher group. Because uh, it's comic sketcher. Charles has got me. Seven. He's got my back. Yeah. I'm with Charles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you go there. We're not. We're not far from Iron Fist. Um, so if that's how you orient yourself, yeah. then find that your anchor. We're not that far. That's your anchor now. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there's lots of curse words there. I've, I've got every issue, issues one through eight, the trade, the beautiful Vantu or hardcover, lots of stuff.
for table 111? We are, we are as far as you can get near from Iron Fist. Fist. Yeah. <laughs> Basically the opposite side. Same like general area, Budapest? but on the far end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're in a weird comic book common purgatory. There's like this little we're void. We're facing a wall and table. there's print walls on either side of it, so it's like <laughs> a yeah, dungeon. Fine. Craig packs there though, Dungeon. so you're not like completely That's true. Yeah, you know, I got Joe Eisman beside us, so he's, you know, he's in comic jail with the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I guess we got a couple minutes for, for questions if you guys have any before we, you know, yeah. Bam. Sure, so um, like you guys were talking about how it can be fun to play in other people's playgrounds, you guys have done it. Um, but what I like, what I love about Image Comics is that um, you guys are so free that you do these crazy things. Like who would have thought, hey, let's make some cops that police a world where chicken's illegal. Who would have thought, like, let's make She's a comic book where when you orgasm time stops. like. That stuff is like insane, but it all makes sense like within the context of the book. Um, what's something within the projects you're working on that you don't think you could have done anywhere except Image? Oh, I, I think with Family Trade, there's probably zero chance that we could have done a full watercolor book with uh, Talking Cats. That's that's a hard sell. And glowing um, fish. And glowing fish. Lamp yeah, the lamp rays. Hmm. You see, because they're lamps. And they're <laughs> the feeder that goes around. <laughs> You guys will be best friends with uh, Brandon Graham then, because he he loves the visual puns too. And Ryan Brown. Multiple heads. To be fair, I'm a big fan of puns across the board. <laughs> he's he's visual and otherwise. Because he's a monster. Yeah, I am a human monster. I mean, you're no Casey Gilly, but pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, one of the, this is this is kind of a. Um, I mean, it's 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 sort of a, a small thing. I don't know if you would. I don't know if you would. You'll see it the same way I do. But like, there's a there's a point. Uh, there's a lot of baseball stuff in curse words. Uh, because Ryan Brown absolutely loves baseball. He loves it a lot. I don't know very much about it. I don't watch baseball, whatever. So what I do is I write baseball stuff in the book that I get wrong. I get quite wrong. And then um, he's like, well, you know, that's not, that's not how this works. And I'm like, well, this is what the story demands, buddy. <laughs> so then, the Yankees score a touchdown. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not quite that bad, but there's things like, there's a point where like a bunch of people in baseball so you can flip a coin and he's like that doesn't happen in baseball I'm like well it happens in the book so um, uh, which it's like it's one of those jokes that gets funnier and funnier every time I do it to me and I asked Ryan, <laughs> ask Ryan if he thinks if he's enjoying it. he's like you know honestly man I'm not this is like kind of a drag I love baseball so much I'm like cool cool dude <laughs> um, so we uh, so we put uh, like a, a version of Yankee Stadium in 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 the book, uh, and that is something that if I were to try and do that at like Marvel or something, they would be like, absolutely not. The Yankees will sue. Like, don't you cannot do it. Uh, but because Image, like it all, it's going to just land on us if something bad happens. <laughs> like, you can do it at Image. And so I did everything I could. I renamed it Northerner Stadium, uh, relocated it to a, a different borough. Did a lot, but it still Northern looks like Yankee Stadium. Stadiums. Northerners, Yankees. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, it's clever. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> There's, a, there's another part where they go, there's a football game, um, and the team is the New York Airplanes. It's like the New York Jets, the New York Airplanes. So, yeah. You were playing with friends, but now it's over. I thought we had something here. Boys and Claws. I would say the single biggest thing I'm able to do with my book is I just don't have to turn anybody, anything into anybody to get approval. Like, I don't have to pre-write anything. I just yeah, sit right. down mm -hmm. at my computer, and if the story tells me to go in this direction today, that's where I'm going. That's I don't it. need to have, I have no hoops to jump through. And that, it's my favorite thing. I'm just like, what, what we're we going to do today? I have no idea, but we're going to find out. And I love that about Image, that I can just have freedom to, just do whatever I feel like that on any given day. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not not so dissimilar. I, the, and it's not even not a story point or anything. But when Image, I had self-published uh, Headlopper for a little while, and I had done two two comics, uh, the materials in in Headlopper one, and one was like twenty pages, and I was like, I didn't get anywhere in this story in twenty pages, and I quickly learned I I hated that kind of monthly length. So the next self-published thing I had done was like 45 pages or so and I just said I'm gonna write to the pace I want to write uh, and to this certain point in the story and wherever wherever I end up that's the page count. It's a great point man. That's yeah. totally, that's, yeah. that's a really, I didn't think what that's at like if you need two extra pages you do it. I mean yeah. you have to pay for it you know like yeah. you're, you're, it's a cost that hits you but 
you know, yeah, so I, I fell in love with that, like, serving the story idea. Mm -hmm. And so when Image was like, hey, do you want to keep making Hidlop or Bo with us? Uh, I was, I almost didn't even ask him, but I was just like, look, like, I like this kind of 45 page, uh, you know, page count length story. I was like, but I can't, I can't make that book in a month. I was like, can it, can Hidlop or come out in really, uh, really big issues, but just come out quarterly then? And uh, and I thought they'd be like McLean, what are you doing? That's not how comics work. Like, what, what, what are you what are you doing? And uh, and Eric Stevenson was like, yeah, sure. Didn't think twice about it. He was just like, yeah, if that's how you want to tell Headlopper, then do it. And like, I was just like, holy shit! Like, I can actually just serve the story, you know? And uh, and it's it's been amazing. I, I get to it's tell it exactly. Eric, that's a very Eric Stevenson response. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. 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 It's funny, I was way, I actually done a lot of uh, image issues before I realized that there was absolutely nothing stopping me from ending a book on a double page thread, <laughs> which you yeah. cannot do yeah. in yep. big two books. It's like, I can do that, and I can, I can put stuff on the inside for a cover if I want to. Yeah. Way too many issues before I realized the freedom I actually had. I even advertised my Dark Horse book in my image book. <laughs> yeah, wow. absolutely. Oh, yeah. You will like, never wait, do what? Yeah. Yeah. Dave, when I did our, my thank you letter, Dave's like, nobody does that. And if you do that, you have to put that at the end of the book. I'm like, well, why would I do that? Why would I put that at the end of the book where people may or may not see it? It's the most important thing. Put it at the front page. So yeah, you do, like, do whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Jim Rugg, who does Street Angel, yeah. like, it was his idea to do every single volume as a hardcover. You go yeah. over and see that in comic book stores. It's an oversized hardcover, and it's just a stand. Everything's a standalone story, and yeah. that's the Image Comics way. And that's how, yeah, that's how Street Angel was beforehand. So he just lets it keep, you know, serving the story. Yeah, that's yeah, really, it's really something. Any other, any other questions, guys? Yes. Uh, what would you guys say is your favorite part of the creative process? Would it be the Initial stages where you're creating ideas or pitching the idea, maybe collaborating in the middle, whether you're illustrating, writing, trying to get feedback, or is it maybe at the end when it's finished and you're here talking about the, the product you're so happy about? I mean, with any project, at least for me, you have this beautiful, perfect moment when you've got the idea as like this thing that exists out there and you have a it up yet. <laughs> and that is pretty great. And every time it gets closer to the page, you're like, I'm I'm not it was so cool and now it's not. And i you know that that the upside to that is at least for me is that then when you see it actually credited it's a thing, you're like, oh I made a thing. And you know, I've published like 170 issues of comics now and I'm still excited when I get that new thing. I'm not made a thing. So you know it's good. Uh, I think my favorite part would definitely have been when uh, we got approved for it, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting the proofs from Morgan, like uh, getting to see like everything actually like put out and not like stupid looking, like it doesn't suck. Um, it's like something I can like show my mom and be like, see, look, I can be cool. <laughs> um, and the world building, like to come up with things that like no one is gonna give a shit about in like five minutes and like. The only person who's going to care is me. Like, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, mine, so, so in the production, the way curse words happens is, so I write a script first, then Ryan um, draws, draws all the pages, and in, for issue one, he showed me like layouts and we kind of talked about it, but then he doesn't do that anymore. So I don't see it at all until, it, until the inks are completely done. So he gets a script, we might, you know, we'll talk, we talk all the time, we talk almost every day. Uh, but he, I don't see it. I don't see it until it's done. And he sends it to me and he's like, okay, this is it. Now it's time to do a, a lettering pass. So I'll, I'll do another pass on the script to give it to Chris Crank, who does the lettering on the book, who's awesome. Um, and then after, so Chris then sends it back to me. So that's the first time I've seen it as a comic balloon. It's usually not colored at that point. It's black and white art with balloons in. And then I'll do a, an edit pass on that. And that part is my favorite part because that's when I can really be like, okay, this joke works, this joke doesn't work. There's another way to do this line. Um, oh my God, Ryan drew the, the funniest, craziest thing here and I can turn this into something. Um, I can make, make it better than it was. Uh, and it's, it feels like the purest time when um, everyone really except the colorist, like you know, three out of the four main creative people have put their, their it's all coming together in this amazing way that can t take it to the next level. And, and I would say every issue of Curse Words, and I would guess 
most people's comics, like a lot of magic happens in that in that moment, the the last lettering pass, um, and I always love it. Uh, it's just a chance to really. It's when you 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 have all of the everybody's ideas are are in front of you, and you can come up with new ideas. You 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 are inspired by your collaborators in a way that it's hard to do when you're just sitting typing on a computer screen. So that's my favorite part. Yeah, for me, it's getting the the pages from A and seeing usually. In fact, always, whatever I envisioned in my head, realized on the page even better than I could have imagined it. And I, I, I'm always like, happy dance day, I got pages. So yeah, for me it's always, and then, then it's like, you get the colors, and it's like, happy dance day, they're more beautiful than I could have imagined. So yeah, I don't know, I just love the whole process. Um, for me, and probably many people, my, my joy and excitement is uh, extremely fleeting. I, I've, got, I've only got five minutes of each idea of being like, McLean, you did it, before I'm like, McLean, kill yourself, like, you're the worst. That's a real, you know? that's a real, that's, that's a real five, no, that's yeah. dramatic, I shouldn't go wow. there. But, uh, but like, yeah, at my, like, I'll, I'll come up with an idea or something, and I'm like, that's brilliant, I love it, and then the older it gets, the less I like it. So, like, every step of the way, I get little rewards, luckily. Um, and so, yeah, when I first break a story idea, I'm like really excited because I always feel like, oh, I, I get to do this a little while longer before they kick me out. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so that's, <laughs> yeah, I get the five minutes. And, uh, and, uh, but yeah, at the same time, I get, I get a little pumped up when I get colors from Jordy. Jordy's like insane. It's like she reads my mind, like I hardly give her any edits. Like the pages will come in and, and like honestly if I'll get something that's even just a little not quite feeling right, I'll be like, hmm, and I'll just sit with it and I'll watch and it's really insane. Like I'll see that file pop out of my Dropbox and like pop back in and um, and somehow she's like put new magic on it and then I'm like, oh my god, like she's like makes makes my comics like comics, you know? So then same thing, like then when it's like the letters go on, I'm like, oh, this is a comic. So every time that you feel like you, you've, uh, or every time I feel like I've made something, I get a little like reward, and each one of those little rewards gets me through the, the self doubt that pretty much everyone feels. That I feel like, you know. all right. I think that's it. All right, thanks so much. Yeah.